AP Human Geography students, welcome back to my channel. So today I am continuing our discussion on urban patterns. If you're in my class, we introduced some models in Key Issue 2. I want to recap a few uh, uh, ideas from this Key Issue. And then I also want to talk about Key Issue 3. So in Key Issue 2, we're talking about where people are distributed within urban areas. And to explain where people are distributed within urban areas, we uh, talked about three models. We talked about the concentric zone model from the 1920s. We talked about the sector model from the 1930s and the multiple nuclei model that was developed in the 1940s, developed by sociologists, economists. The, the idea here is that different models can begin to help us explain why people live in certain areas and how things are growing within urban areas. Um, according to uh, the concentric zone model, we can see this in Houston. We can see this in the age of housing, where housing is newer in the outer rings of the city than in the inner rings. Um, and so you see that percent housing built since 20 or 2005, 20 uh, and above in this uh, pinker area is this outer ring showing us the concentric zone model in Houston. We can also see the sector model in Houston. We see the distribution of high income households. The medium household income is the highest in this sector to the west. And so we have this sector here. We have high household income, in this case, above $120,000. And so that would show us the sector model in Houston. And then we can also see the multiple nuclei model in Houston. The distribution, uh, by looking at the distribution of minorities, Hispanics occupy nodes to the north, in this blue, and to the southeast of downtown, and African Americans occupy nodes to the south um, and to the northeast here, right? So that would show the multiple nuclei model in Houston. And so one city can actually uh, have variations of urban models to show us various things from race and ethnicity to median household income and new housing. So again, concentric zone, sector model, and the multiple nuclei model, all in Houston. Now, American urban areas, as I started talking about before, are urban areas um, in America do differ from elsewhere in the world. Um, in Europe, we see sectors in Europe, the wealthy still live in the inner portions of the upper class sector, not just in suburbs, like most of the affluent areas of the United States. Concentric zones in Europe, most of the newer housing is built in the suburbs, and that's high rise apartment buildings for low income people and recent immigrants, unlike the United, uh, United States. So here is a map of Paris. This is showing you sectors in Paris. Wealthier people are living in the center and to the southwest sector, often above sidewalk caf cafes, or living in these apartments here with the cafes down here, and other consumer services that they, they want to be a part of. And so that would be very different from the American model. The American models would show this being the ring of lower income housing. This is the actual upper class areas here from downtown Paris and the Versailles. Okay, notice where the poorer people are living on their outskirts here and here in different sectors. Um, in the developing countries, the poor are accommodated in the suburbs. The wealthy live near the center of the city as well as in a sector extending from the city. So in, in this model here, we've got the market, the central business district. Now right down here like this mall, uh, we have the commercial zone here. Uh, we have zone of peripheral squatter settlements where a lot of the poor are here. Okay. Now be in developing areas. Um, we can look at the stages of cities developing uh, in developing countries. We see pre-colonial cities. Before the Europeans established colonies, most people lived in rural settlements. Uh, there were but a few principal cities in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So like in present-day Mexico, the Aztecs built the city of uh, Tenochtitlan, uh, where present-day Mexico City is uh, located. 
colonial cities, European uh, colonialization gained control of Latin America, Asia, and Africa, they expanded the existing cities to provide colonial services. So we can see kind of the evolution of these pre-colonial cities, right? So the Aztecs, you know, build, building on um, a lake, and then the center of the city was dominated by the temple, and then the twin shrines on the top of the temple were dedicated to the Aztec god, and, and um, you know, just this idea of how the city developed in pre-colonial world was very different. Um, examples we would see in the colonial cities, administration, military command, uh, international trade, housing for European settlers. Um, since gaining independence from European colonizers, cities became the focal point of change. Millions of immigrants that arrived into them and searched for work. And in some cities like Mexico City, previous social patterns from the uh, previous century are actually being reinforced with the very wealthy and those in power uh, live in certain certain areas. All right, so that brings us to the end of our uh, brief discussion on urban patterns with three different models. Let's go ahead and start key issue three. So key issue three is why are urban areas expanding? So we spent time talking about why services cluster downtown. We talked about three different models to explain where people are distributed within urban areas. And now let's talk about why there's an expansion of urban areas. So there are several definitions that have been created to characterize cities and their suburbs. So I wanna go through um, a few of them. So first of all, the term city defines an urban settlement that has been legally incorporated into an independent self-governing unit. In the United States, these urban settlements are sometimes known as central cities. Um, in order to be classified as a city, to be incorporated, you have to apply to the state. Uh, in the United States, the state would then recognize the smaller division of power. So cities are under the jurisdiction, technically, of the state and are thus created or given their jurisdictional powers by the state. Uh, so here we have a central city. Uh, here is the city of St. Louis. Technically, this is the city limits of St. Louis in this uh, red. But the orange is showing the urbanized area. And then again, we have these urban clusters uh, around St. Louis. And then, uh, you know, the metropolitan statistical area for calculation of the urban center would all be all of this county uh, section surrounding St. Louis and then we have the micropolitan statistical area that would be added here um, but this red line is showing us the core base statistical area when we talk about the population of a city it isn't just this portion of St. Louis that is the population but rather this entire area in red and so the city, if you live near a city uh, and, and you want to talk about the population of the city, it does depend on what type of statistical uh, compilation that they're using. Typically, when you see city uh, populations, we're talking about the metropolitan statistical area of this area. So this whole thing is really considered like St. Louis, but technically, this is the central city. This is actually St. Louis, the city in this red area. An urban area consists of a dense core of census tracts, densely settled suburbs, low density land that links those dense suburbs with the core. And so in the census, which we just saw one in 2020, there are two types of urban areas. An urbanized area, okay, is an urban area with at least 50,000 inhabitants. And then an urban cluster is an urban area with between 2,500 and 50,000 inhabitants. So if we go back to this map, these red dots are urban clusters. And then the urbanized area, which has to have at least 50,000 people, is this orange. The United States Bureau of the Census has created a method of measuring the functional area of a city. Um, as I said just a second ago, we call that the Metropolitan Statistical Area, or MSA. It includes an urbanized area with a population of at least 50,000, the county within which the city is located, and adjacent counties with a high population density and a large percentage of residents working in the central city's county. And so that would be added and much more expansive than just the downtown area. So think about, you know, a city that's close to you. In the case of the students in my class, that would be Pittsburgh. 
So it would, you know, metropolitan statistical area would include most of Allegheny County, right? But it's also going to include little pockets of like Southern Butler County where a lot of people have um, created businesses and new developments uh, because of lower taxes, but they're actually, you know, part of the city central structure and in, in, in daily commuting. Some adjacent metropolitan statistical areas overlap so that they form one continuous urban complex. And probably the best example of this is Megalopolis, you know, from the northern area of Boston the whole way down to south of Washington, D.C. Uh, it was actually geographer uh, Gene Gottman that called this Megalopolis, which means great city. And these metropolitan statistical areas overlap, you know, Boston overlaps New York and, and overlaps uh, Philadelphia and overlaps uh, DC and into Baltimore. Most US metropolitan areas have a council of government, which is a cooperative agency cons consisting of various local government representatives. And the purpose may be to do some overall planning for the area that couldn't be performed by a single local government because of the overlap. Uh, the process of legally adding land to a city is called annexation. Many U.S. cities grew very rapidly in the 1800s because they offered better services uh, than the rural countryside, like water supply systems, sewage disposal. Uh, the United States tends to become less and less dense as you venture away from the city center, and we call that a density gradient. So here we can take a look at Chicago as an example. So Chicago is, uh, you know, pre-planned city and the the deepest part of Lake Michigan, and so. Uh, this yellow area showing the city limits in 1837, and then we see areas annexed here in 1870, and then in orange 18, uh, 1890, and then we get into the 1900s, uh, and as, as late as 1990, seeing pieces annexed here, and then you have this uh, different scale map here showing you, you know, zoomed out here, um, Chicago as far as the dense area of population all of the area that we consider Chicago today. But the further you get away from downtown CBD Chicago, then and the further you get outside of this metropolitan statistical area, you see a density gradient. Um, you know, one of the things that we recognize is there is something called suburban sprawl um, as, as um, a flattening of the density gradient of the metropolitan area it means that people and services are spread out, out over a larger area. Right? So U.S. suburbs are characterized by being sprawled from the city. And this progressive spread of development over the landscape is something that we can see in newer housing, uh, with some of that type of leapfrogging where we see like Monroeville really becoming an extension of Pittsburgh, being connected by bus lines and, and different, um, different highways, a lot of people to commute, or perhaps a lot of people who then live in what is now, you know, a, a not technically a suburb, but we consider that like a sprawling suburb, um, or living in Monroeville and going to Pittsburgh. And there is suburban segregation. The modern residential suburb is segregated by social class, for instance, where similar priced houses are typically built in close proximity to each other, and so that attracts a specific range of income earners. Okay, and this would be an example of a segregated, gated community in, in Los Angeles uh, suburb. And then land use as residents are separated from commercial and manufacturing activities that are confined to compact distinct areas. And so you have zoning ordinances enacted in the 20th century have contributed to the segregation of land uses within suburban areas. Uh, and here is a map of a housing plan here. And that land use would be residential only. When you get into urban transportation, we recognize that most people in the United States are using motor vehicles. Cars and trucks are permitted large-scale development of suburbs at greater distances from the city center. We need roads and people drive back and forth, but they take up a considerable amount of space. An average city allocates about 25% of its lands to roads and parking lots. Um, and here in Pittsburgh, par parking in downtown Pittsburgh is, is expensive as it is in a lot of other areas because it's such valuable land. Multi-lane freeways uh, can cut giant paths through the heart of a city, and valuable land in the central city is often devoted to parking these vehicles. Um, motor vehicles are one of the greatest challenges to also reducing pollution. 
um, and automakers are continuing to scramble to find other uh, ways to be more fuel efficient. So things like ethanol, plugging in hybrids, hydrogen fuel cells as ways to become more efficient and cut down on the pollution that's taking place by the congestion of vehicles in downtown areas. Um, this is a notable map, electricity by U.S. state. Dependency on non-renewable and polluting fuels to generate electricity does vary by states. And finally, we do know that public transportation has a lot of benefits and a lot of limitations, and you can go ahead and pause and check that out, but people need to not overlook alternative sources of commuting within cities. This is Social Studies with Mrs. Johns.